Welcome back to the latest episode of Japan's top business interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, the president of Dale Carnegie Training Tokyo Japan. And my specialist today is Peter Kamatz, who is the managing director for AB InBev Japan. Peter, welcome. Good afternoon, Greg. So, Peter, tell us a little bit of your background. How is it that you're running AB InBev in Japan? How did you get to this position? Okay, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for inviting me, first of all. Um, so, I started my career at AB InBev uh, 15 years ago. I'm、okay. from Belgium.、Mm -hmm. So, I、uh, grew up in Belgium, studied in Leuven, which is、uh, still the base of our headquarters of,、uh, of AB InBev. Um, from my student time in,、uh, in Leuven, I、uh, rolled in into the AB InBev business.、Uh, started in a commercial position there as a sales rep, visiting stores, driving the execution、uh, in the stores.、Um, and then moved up into different positions in Belgium for nine years.、Um, did a lot of commercial functions, category management,、uh, key account management, lots of negotiation, trade marketing, which is、uh, very brand related. Um, and then, after nine years in Belgium, I got the opportunity to move to France、mm. to、uh, become the sales director for the retail channel in,、uh, in France.、Uh, very exciting,、uh, new market for me, of course,、uh, different market position as well. In Belgium, we have a very strong market share. In France, we are a challenger.、Um, worked、uh, two years, a bit more than two years in that position in France.、Uh, then I became responsible for、uh, one of our business units in Europe. Which was France, Netherlands, and Scandinavia.、Uh, it was pre COVID time, so、uh, involved also a lot of travel,、uh, exciting times, also again, challenger positions on the different markets. So, um, um, interesting、uh, development curve there,、uh, broad business to manage. And then,、uh, end of、uh, 2020, summer 2020, the company proposed me to.、Uh, To go for a first、uh, outside of Europe job.、Um, and so they、uh, proposed me to become responsible for Japan, New Zealand, and、uh, the Pacific Islands. Oh, that's quite a big territory.、Right? Yeah. Yeah, big yeah. territory.、Right? Yeah. And so you arrived here when?、Uh, November 2020, I arrived in,、uh, in Japan with、right. a little, little stop in、uh, South Korea first for.、Uh, Visa reasons. Visa reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah.、Okay. it was a difficult time to,、uh, to travel, but、uh, we managed. So, was this your first?、Uh, Chance to run a reasonably big team? Had you had that chance when you were in France, or、uh, how's the comparison there? No,、um, when I arrived in,、uh, in France, it was in 2016.、Uh, my team was about、uh, 100 people.、Oh, so that was the、team. first time I, I had a.、Uh, yeah, 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 so you were your first management gig is 100 people? Um, yeah, I was also managing, no, I was managing smaller teams first in Belgium. Okay. But、right. then moving to France, first、right. mission outside of my home country,、yeah. was a team of,、uh, I, was, I was leading the retail channel, so I was responsible for the key account manager team, which was eight people,、right. but also the full field sales team,、right. uh, which was about 60 people in France. And then we had also external merchandisers, so in total was about 100 people.、Mm. Um, and then when I became responsible for a business unit, Uh, the full team in France, Netherlands, and Scandinavia was about、uh, 400 people, something like that. So it's quite、like、big.、That. So, yeah, how big is、yeah. the team in Japan? We have、uh, about 70 people in Japan. 70, 70, people, 70、right? yes. So, you've actually had good experience in managing people already, leading people already in Europe, and then you come to Japan for the first time. So, what were some of the challenges you found? Okay, I'm now in a different country, different culture, different language, everything's changed. You're still you, the company's still you know, selling beers and other beverages. So, what did you find was different or challenging about being a leader here? Yeah, interesting、uh, question. Of course, we,、uh, we all face these、uh, cultural differences.、Uh, was already the case when I moved from Belgium to France,、mm. but of course, not so drastic as moving from Europe to,、um, to uh, East Asia.、Mm. Um, as you mentioned, Greg, the, the company is stable. We have a very clear company culture、um, with a, a company purpose, principles that we execute all over the world. We try to live up to that every day. Um, me is always me. I try to be my genuine me、uh, all、mm -hmm. the time in,、uh, mm -hmm. in, in every country that I, that I go.、Um, but the team, one of the biggest、um, things that I noticed in the beginning, I managed、uh, the team like two or three months through, through, through Zoom in a digital way, basically, because、uh -huh. I became responsible. But、uh, we were not able, due to visa reasons, yet to go to Japan. I think lots of people have been facing that、uh, in COVID. 
And um, I noticed that I was talking to the team and at the end of some of the discussions, you expect a, a discussion and you expect a conversation. Everybody was just looking at me <laughs> digitally through my laptop. So I thought it was a digital thing. I said, okay, like it's difficult to get a conversation going. But then arriving in Japan in November uh, 2020 and bringing the team together for the first time, it seemed to be also the reality in person. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a big difference uh, because in the European countries where I worked, people are generally sharing their opinion, yeah. uh, giving feedback, yeah. uh, open for a discussion that mm -hmm. leads to a better conclusion. While here, uh, what I noticed is that um, in bigger groups, people don't speak up. Right. When you do a one-to-one -one afterwards and you come back on certain points, everybody has a, a very good opinion mm -hmm. about things. Mm -hmm. But people, at least in the beginning when I arrived here, didn't speak up in group. So mm -hmm. that's, that was a big change for me. Mm. So what were some other things you found was different or challenging as a leader? In Japan compared mm -hmm. to Europe? Mm -hmm. Um, communication, because mm -hmm. of course there's a language difference. Mm -hmm. So making sure that the strategy translates into execution and making sure that all layers of the organization understand it mm -hmm. um, is another challenge that I faced and I'm still facing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, so, of course, I'm looking together with my team for solutions to mm -hmm. cascade it even more clear and even more better that everybody understands. Uh, but that's a big challenge as well. In Belgium, I, I speak Dutch and French. In, in France, I speak French. Uh, I don't yet speak Japanese. I'm learning. But mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a challenge, the communication aspect, mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, the nuance, the details of what you would like the team to execute is clear for everyone. Mm. So you've been here, what, about a year and a half now? Yeah, almost, yeah. year and a half. So what other things you found a bit challenging about leading in Japan? Um, the pace that thing ha things happen mm -hmm. can also be um, different to what I know before. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that, and I can only talk about my own uh, observations, of course, my own impressions of things, but in Japan, um, the whole is much more important than the individual. Mm -hmm. So it means that people are not, according to me, people are not very much into change. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Um, they mm -hmm. like to keep things stable. Mm -hmm. The way that it works historically, mm -hmm. will it will also work in the future. Mm -hmm. And we come here as a, as a challenger, ABM, in the business. So, of mm -hmm. course, we want to change things. We want to mm -hmm. grow. We want to accelerate things. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to drive consumer behavior towards, uh, towards our brands. We want to open the opportunities that we have in the market. And there is more reluctance to change than in other countries that I worked before. So that's a challenge for the leadership as well. And have you got any indications on why that's the case? Have you sort of understood why that reluctance to change is strong here? I think there's a strong conviction that uh, uh, never change a winning team. Like what works, let's keep it working, don't change too much, uh, which has its obviously very positive sides. Uh, but I think that's a downside because it, it blocks a bit of the innovation mm -hmm. um, because challenging each other, changing things can also drive innovation. Uh, and innovation then drives uh, further opportunities, of course. Um, and that's something that I, I, I think in Japan uh, a lot is uh, based on what historically works. Don't touch it. Let's, let, let it keep working. Let it keep doing, doing his thing. Mm -hmm. And this means that everybody gets part of the, of the, of the benefit. The benefit is shared among the, amongst a lot of people. Everybody uh, is, is contributing to the whole. And that whole... That bigger picture is much more important than individual challenges or individual changes. Uh, there are not a lot of extremes in Japan. It's mm. all through the average and everybody walks in the average, I have the impression. Mm. And what was your approach? I mean, you you finally get, you've had Zoom meetings, which is not, as you said, mm. so easy, but actually physically arrive. What was your approach when you physically arrived? How did you think about what's my strategy for leading this team? What am I going to do? you know, initially, uh, mid-term, long-term. What were your thoughts on that? Yeah, you have, of course, different uh, types of, of leadership style. Uh, I think it's important as for any leader in any organization in any country to define your leadership style. What do you want to stand for? 
um, and then try to um, define the way how you bring that to the team. Um, my leadership style is about um, being together with the team, mm. um, fighting together to drive change, giving certain directions, a framework to work in, but also giving them the opportunity to contribute uh, within that framework and within mm. that, that strategy that we define. Um, getting to know the people as well is very important for me, not only on the business side, but also to a certain extent on the personal side. And how do you do that? You don't speak the language, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. You don't uh, first exposure to Japanese culture. How do you work that to get to know people better? Yeah. So what I defined for myself is that once this leadership style is more or less defined, I don't, of course, you can improve it and round the corners and, and, and challenge yourself to, to optimize. Um, but I don't change drastically. I, I define for myself, I don't want to change that drastically, no matter what culture I go, mm -hmm. because it would not last too long for myself. I think if you present yourself as differently than, than what you really are, I don't think it lasts for a long time. Mm -hmm. So this genuine me that we talked about in the beginning, I also wanted to implement here. The way to do that um, in the beginning when I arrived here was COVID. So normally I try to talk to a lot of people personally, mm -hmm. was not possible. So what I did is in my first 100 days, I organized a Zoom session mm -hmm. uh, with each and everybody, each and every person in the organization. So all the 70 people mm -hmm. just to get to know session. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Do you have questions for mm -hmm. me? Present myself mm -hmm. and so on. Um, in order to you know, also have them feeling what, um, 30 oh, minutes, 30 minutes, 30 okay. minutes. So that's 70 yeah. people, 30 minutes, a yeah. big chunk of your time. Yeah. 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 But an important mm -hmm. one, I mm -hmm. think if you want to define strategy and drive execution and make them understand what you want, mm -hmm. you also need to understand who they are and what they want. And mm -hmm. you need to make them understand who you are and what you want. Mm -hmm. So that's an important step for me. Mm -hmm. This, this mm -hmm. personal connection, mm -hmm. uh, in order to drive the business strategy. Just on that point, you know, uh, trying to engage a team, existing team, new team, you're new, they're the existing team, all of these have levels of complexity in them. What have you found so far has worked well to engage a team, given that probably not everyone's in the office every day, uh, people are still working from home? What have you found has been working well for you? Um... What's working well, first of all, is our communication and clarity. Mm -hmm. um, people want an answer. If it's a yes mm -hmm. or a no, at least they want clarity. Mm -hmm. Communication needs to be very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, company strategy, expectations from the people. Mm -hmm. um, that drives engagement. Um, giving people the opportunity to speak up. Secondly, mm -hmm. so communication mm -hmm downwards but mm -hmm. also two-way communication mm -hmm. is something that sits very closely into our uh, our principles mm -hmm. um, of AB InBev making sure that people are able to share their opinion mm -hmm. we are an, an organization that has uh, of course hierarchical layers um, but we have very low barriers between the different layers in our organization mm -hmm. meaning that um, we are open for a good conversation at any time, at any moment, between the different layers of the organization. We accept critique, of course, in mm -hmm. a respectful way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that helps also to drive engagement uh, uh, a lot. Uh, communication and giving clarity, two-way communication uh, from the team, uh, listening to, uh, to what, they, uh, what they want. That, that for me is, uh, is very important to drive so engagement. So do, uh, do you get critique? Do you get pushback? Do you get uh, people challenging uh, the direction? More and more because I asked them to do that. Oh, you asked them, so. <laughs> so we moved away from the I talk to a meet during a meeting and everybody looks at me at the end and the meeting ends. So we moved away from that okay. and we move much more to constructive debate um, and, uh, and conversations. How did you do that? What, how is the format to get that going? Um, one thing that helps very well is um, sharing an agenda up front, including preparation from the team, mm -hmm. because then they have time to think about it mm -hmm. up front mm -hmm. and then they can come with their input and this mm -hmm. leads to a good discussion. Mm -hmm. A good discussion always leads to a better conclusion, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm a type of leader also, at least I try to be, that is able to adapt my opinion mm -hmm. if somebody else has a better opinion, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's important. Of course, you do this also by 
managing through the line and by being consistent to that. If you mm -hmm. ask their input, but you never change your opinion, they will not come with an input anymore. Mm -hmm. So I send out a clear agenda, ask preparation for the meeting, and then in certain topics, I, uh, after certain topics, there is a, a briefing and then we discuss. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we conclude. It's also very important to conclude, mm. to not keep the debate open, but to conclude. And one of the things often I hear on these podcasts, talking to other leaders when they first came and started leading a team in Japan, was they'd have these discussions and they'd be in the meeting and they'd make a decision on something. And then weeks would roll by. And then they'd think, oh, by the way, what happened about that decision? And they go in and search on what happened about the decision. And guess what? Nothing happened on the decision. So it was a bit of a facade that, yes, we're in the meeting room, we all agree, but they don't execute. So what's been your experience of actually getting a conclusion in a meeting to get an execution piece later? Um, good question. Um, first of all, it's very important that um, the debate and the conclusion is accepted um, and understood by everybody around the table in order for them to execute it. That's why I'm also a strong believer in this collaborative approach, because you push, if you push everything top down, it will not be executed. Um, so a common sense of agreement around the table that we all go for it and that we all agree, that's first of all very important. Secondly, um, I tend to micromanage on some things. Mm. If there are uh, important decisions that we took, that are really defining the strategy and the execution of our business, I make sure that I follow up with the people on a regular basis on that. So and some call it micromanagement. I call it ensuring good execution. You have a, 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 the RIC reports. You've got about, what, 10 or so? Direct uh, eight. Report? Eight, eight RIC yeah. reports, right? So uh, when you're trying to make sure that things are being done, micromanaging to some extent, how do you keep track of everything? Because, you know, you've got lots of meetings, you've got, you're being pulled with headquarters, the market, you've got reporting, you've got a whole range of activities as a leader that you're responsible for. So how do you make sure that nothing falls off the table? Yeah, that's uh, each, each and every person, of course, need to, to own and define their own agenda. I'm a, a person that has a um, uh, regular frequent one-to-ones with my direct reports. Mm -hmm. Short ones, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. uh, each two weeks, which most of them, one time every two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why is that um, I want to be able to come back to some of the points that we decided to mm -hmm. make sure that there's a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to give them also the platform to talk business or mm -hmm. talk career or talk mm -hmm. people management or mm -hmm. questions that they have. Mm -hmm. I always tell them if there are urgent things, don't wait for the one to one. Mm -hmm. Reach out, we plan a meeting, we chat in the office, mm -hmm. uh, works very well. But I do have these official timings that gives me the opportunity to come back on some of the des decisions that we agreed on. Mm -hmm. And that is also an official platform for them to or discuss business or anything they want to discuss. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that, you know, AB InBev is a challenger in the market. Okay, so automatically you cannot keep just doing the same things in the same way and getting the same results. So you've got to have some degree of innovation, creativity, uh, be it in your marketing or positioning, through your distribution, through your sizing, through whatever it might be, uh, flavors, uh, seasons, there's a range of things that are possible. Now, what have you found has worked well in getting innovation in the team? Apart from you yourself coming from uh, Europe, coming from your experience there, you've got a certain range of ideas and you've seen things work, but this is Japan, it's always a little bit different. What have you found has worked well of getting the team to come up with ideas for this market? Mm. Um, what works best and what everybody asks in the team is see examples from other countries. Mm -hmm. That's what works best. And there we have the big advantage that we have the biggest brewer globally. Uh, again, we declare a, a clear vision, a clear purpose of the company to bring people together for, uh, for, uh, for more cheers, basically. Uh, we, we want to dream big as a company always drive things in order to uh, to generate more cheers, which means that we want to have people having fun together. 
um, in different ways. We're the social network of people. Basically. You better explain that about the cheers thing because that's that's one of your taglines internally. So just explain okay. that to the uh, listeners and viewers mm. on this podcast. What do you mean by that? You relate that to your uh, your company's tagline or internal tagline. Yeah, the official tagline is uh, we dream big to create a future with more cheers. We dream big to create a future with more cheers in terms cheers. of the cheers of drinking, right? Exactly. Okay, but then you. cheers is uh, the cheers of drinking, of course, because we, we are a mm-hmm. social network. Um, the cheers is also uh, making suppliers happy, for instance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so working closely together with, with, with suppliers to make sure mm-hmm. that everybody um, gets a, a, a good part of the effort and the, and the energy that they put in the business that they do. Also, uh, for instance, works for customers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also try to, to, to create a win-win situation and a good mm-hmm. partnership with, um, with our customers. Uh, communities where we work in uh, is also very important. We have a very strong uh, ESG agenda mm-hmm. uh, at ABMF, driven globally, also here in uh, Budweiser uh, APAC, mm-hmm. um, where we also try to create cheers within the communities that we mm-hmm. operate. We're a big global company, mm-hmm. but we operate on a local level. So we try to close uh, to work very closely together with the local communities. So on that on that local level, you know, my question, I guess, is relating to how much innovation has this team itself from within itself uh, generated creativity innovation for that challenger role in the market Mm. Um, and how did you get them to do it yeah so um, the first step is bringing a lot of inspiration from the company globally Mm -hmm. Um, since we have a lot of toolkits examples things that work we are uh, present in mature markets less mature market developing market there's a lot of content available globally that we uh, that we can share that we can benchmark on to answer your question how do you get them doing that Mm -hmm. it's about hiring the right profiles okay yeah now you didn't hire anyone you, you've got a received team, right? So uh, maybe from now you're going to be hiring people, you've started hiring people, but probably 99% of the people were given to you. So you don't have that option of, okay, oh, I'm going to hire a whole bunch of people who are going to be creative. You've got an existing group. What have you found works in getting that existing group to be creative? Yeah, it's it's a small correction. Fifty percent of my direct team changed in the last oh, really? uh, okay. eighteen months since right. uh, since I arrived okay. here. So I did change, I, I did recruitment uh, already to to try to put um, the right profiles on the right uh, right right profiles on the right job, which is always a, a challenge, I think, for every leader and uh, and every company. And is that change over reflection of? Uh, they weren't signing on for the direction you were taking the company, or you realised that they're the, you know, they're sort of the wrong people on this bus. They should be on a different bus, and you needed to bring in people who have more creativity. No, I did some structural changes when I arrived uh, in terms of organisational structure because mm-hmm. um, there were certain departments that were not yet developed here, certain mm-hmm. functions that mm-hmm. were not yet developed here mm-hmm. that I think were very important at the stage of the company that we were now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I also aligned this with my predecessor. I think this is the best way to move forward. He said, OK, based on what I saw over the last two, three years being here, I also think this is the next step. So we had a good continuation a good evolution when I arrived mm-hmm. uh, to reinforce some of the actions, accents of the organizational structure. And by doing that, I needed to reassess which people are fit for the, for the job, which are mm-hmm. the best people. Mm-hmm. And then I also in the, in the people did some changes. And then some pay people uh, dropped off after mm-hmm. a while uh, because of um, yeah, because sometimes different reasons, Greg, to be honest, sometimes personal reason. Mm-hmm. There was somebody that left because mm-hmm. of a, a personal reason. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody that left because of an outside career opportunity that seemed mm-hmm. more interesting mm-hmm. for him. Everybody makes his or her choices, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this gave me the opportunity to recruit, to re-recruit um, 50% of my team, uh, which is good. Was was good to bring in that new mm-hmm. mix. Uh, with the right profiles, that also has a hell of effect on the other profiles that uh, mm-hmm. that remain. And what about getting trust? Because you know, you you come from Europe, you come in, you don't know the team. Unfortunately, you know to recruit maybe half of your leadership team, which is good, and that's automatically going to have a lot more trust because you recruited them, right? But uh, how did you find uh, things that work for you to build trust in the in the total team of seventy? Trust towards. Myself towards yeah. the strategy towards to you, yeah. How do you build trust in the team with from you to them? 
One thing that, of course, my team will be able to explain that better, but one thing that is much appreciated by the team at, le at least is I'm really hardly trying to learn Japanese. <laughs> so that's much appreciated by the team, of course, because um, you don't arrive here as a, a foreigner, as an, as an expat that says, okay, I'm going to try to lead the business here and accelerate for the next two, three years, and then guys, buy, uh, I'm going on my next job. Mm -hmm. That's not my mindset, mm -hmm. uh, has never been. I always mm -hmm. focus on the position that I'm in, mm -hmm. that I'm um, very lucky to get to be able to perform for our company. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll see from there. I don't look at the future yet. So when I come to Japan, mm -hmm. I approach the business as uh, if it would be my own business. Mm -hmm. Also one of our pr principles, we mm -hmm. act as an owner, mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. um, which also means that I try to connect very well to the team, hence the one-to-ones that I talked about, but also the, the Japanese language. I want to be able to do some basic conversation with them, mm -hmm. first of all. Secondly, I think it also helps to understand the culture when mm -hmm. you read, uh, when you learn mm -hmm. the language. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's I'm not doing this in a forced way because mm -hmm. that would not last long. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just who I am. Mm -hmm. And I think people, I hope, People appreciate me for that, and that's how you gain the trust. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, that's a great idea on building the trust. What other things have you found works for you, has worked for you in terms of building trust with people, given that you're not actually physically seeing people every day like you would in a pre-COVID normal situation there at home, you're meeting them on Zoom or whatever, and probably not having that personal contact as much? Um. Next to the, the, the personal small things, I would say uh, what builds trust is delivering results. Mm. Okay. Um, to my experience, you can put or have a high request for people for a, for a, for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't deliver results, people are not going to continue to put all the energy, effort and passion in this. So just if, on that point, we're in the middle of COVID. The hospitality industry, you know, the uh, tourism industry, where you've got a very big uh, commercial business, mm -hmm. is probably being hammered. We've had lockdowns, we've had restrictions on operating hours. There's been a lot of difficult things in the market for your industry that you serve. So, what has been the impact on? You don't have to give me numbers, but I'm just saying, has that had an a material impact on the business that makes that point about getting success that little bit more difficult? Yes, and certainly because the impact in 2021 was even uh, worse for us than in uh, 2020, because there were even more restrictions in, uh, in Japan in 2021. Mm -hmm. But the hospitality sector is 20% uh, of the total industry that we work in. Right. So uh, we were able to accelerate our growth even in 2021 and deliver strong results, even despite all the COVID restrictions. Now, is and that, that creates trust, to come back to your question. Is that because we're sitting at home drinking more beer? Is it sort of the, the consumer through the supermarkets and through the liquor stores to the actual B2C component is holding things up and the B2B has quietened down? Is that why that's working? Um, yes, uh, for sure. Uh, there is a, a, a part of the of the revenue loss from the hospitality sector is compensated by uh, by the retail, of course, because mm -hmm. people have more um, consumption at home. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, in every situation, how difficult it is, even mm -hmm. like COVID, you have winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And in COVID times, it was very important, um, even for us as a global company, even more important, to share the learnings between countries that were more advanced in terms of restrictions compared to mm -hmm. others. Okay. Take the learnings from that on how to behave in an agile way, reallocate resources during times, to your, to the example, to your example from hospitality to, to retail in this example, and try to accelerate the growth to compensate for some of the losses. So the agility is very important. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the Leadership Training for Managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, 
dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. And so in, in terms of, you don't need to go into specifics, I'm not interested in that, but just general in terms of how to run a team, uh, a lot of Japanese teams are based around a type of team result as opposed to individual result. And in the West, it tends to be very individual commission, bonus, this type of thing, reward. Uh, how have you found it with the company in Japan? Are they applying more of a Western style of uh, if you produce individually, you get recognized or is it more of a group? For our company, it's the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. So our rewarding system um, is the same um, system mm -hmm. in every part of the world that we operate. So there is no difference. We really keep strict towards the, the culture of our company, mm -hmm. again, to the purpose that we have as a company, and we execute it. It's very typical at AB InBev that when you go to different countries and visit all over the world, you see people with the same mindset, with the same willingness to win in the market, with the same passion for the company, passion for the brands, of course, as well. Um, and this also translates into a rewarding system. Uh, we win together or we lose together. So in that sense, you know, a lot of uh, companies I've, I've talked to, the presence I've talked to, they said, oh, look, you know, my, my sales weren't firing as much as I wanted. So I increased, you know, I increased the rewards. Mm. I pushed up the numbers, you know, I pushed mm. up the percentages or the bonuses or whatever it might be. No change. And they're sort of like, hang on a minute, what's wrong here? You know, like I'm giving them a greater personal incentive to work hard and succeed and, and be rewarded accordingly. But it wasn't really gelling with the team. It, could, it took them a while to work out, well, what's going wrong here? How's your experience been? It's a difficult question uh, because since we work with the same global rewarding system everywhere, uh, we don't apply this uh, one-off incentives, I would say, in order to, uh, to, to, to drive sales. Generally, out of my experience uh, in Europe, I think it, uh, it, it could work. You could all, we, we have a general uh, global reward system, but of course, uh, we have a local freedom to, uh, to, to, to boost some of the incentives uh, in a more uh, personal and individual way. Is, this, is the global system that type of typical Western personally incentivized methodology, or is it more of a team-based pool incentive system? Uh, first of all, the, the, the company needs to, needs to win and needs mm -hmm. to generate revenues. Mm -hmm. If the company doesn't generate revenues, mm -hmm. we act as owners of the company, so mm -hmm. we also don't expect to get rewarded then. Mm -hmm. If the company doesn't earn, you also don't earn. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. all part, uh, every single, we have 180,000 employees globally. Mm -hmm. Every single person in our company needs to contribute on a daily basis to the, mm -hmm. to the global uh, performance. Mm -hmm. If the performance is there, everybody gets rewarded. If the performance is not there, nobody gets rewarded. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's how, it, that's how it works. Um, and if it goes well? Do I, like for example, if I'm working well and my colleague over here is not working as well, do we get the same bonus or we have the same commission rate or is, there, is it sort of you know, localised to the point that you can reflect input and get an output for that person, which would be different or how does that work? No, there is also an, uh, an individual aspect okay. um, in the total uh, compensation system. Uh, in order to um, value also personal contributions from the people depending on the performance. Right, okay. So it's coming back to 
thinking about building trust, you know, you mentioned learning the language, you mentioned having success. Mm -hmm. uh, what other things have you found works well? Because the, the Japanese uh, business environment is actually quite an emotional environment. Before I got here, I thought it was very uh, logical and uh, very straightforward. But as I've lived here over the years, uh, you just keep running into these very emotional things. Like people will change jobs because they've got an emotional connection with a previous boss. Like the boss moves and the boss says, hey, listen, come and join me. And they do. They quit their company and they go and join. That's not a logical, necessarily usually a logical, that's an emotional thing. Or there are things in business that so will keep using this supplier uh, because we we feel comfortable this other supplier can supply maybe at a better rate or a better quality or a better reliability or whatever, high performance, but we're not going to take that because we we like this, we trust this particular supplier. We're not going to make the change. That's not a logical progression. That's an emotional progression. So Japan often has this emotional overlay in business, which is a bit surprising when you first bump up against it because you think, well, logically, that doesn't make any sense except they're not working off logic, they're working off emotion, which is basically coming back to trust. So what have you found that's uh, working well also in terms of getting this emotional connection with people, having that good trust built? With the internal people or external mm. people? Well, it could be both, yeah. It could be mm, both, yeah. Exactly. Um, building trust for me... Um, or, or, or creating trust and, and this emotional connection. I, I do agree that in Japan, but I think, by the way, it's everywhere. It's not only Japan. I think mm -hmm. emotional connection is very important in business anyway. Mm -hmm. We like people to be very rational and logic in business. Mm -hmm. um, I am 100% sure that if you negotiate with somebody and you have a good relationship, that you will get, come to a better conclusion with that person than the other way around. So there's yeah. always a personal and emotional connection yep. that's important, yep. internally and externally. Mm -hmm. So we went through some of the uh, the personal things that I'm trying to be implemented by just just being me in Japan to create this trust with uh, with the team. Um, I also feel going to customers that it's important for them as well. Mm -hmm. When I went in Europe to customers, we talk business. Mm -hmm. I had uh, many meetings here where I go to customers, certainly the first meeting, mm -hmm. and they ask about your family, your mm -hmm. hobbies, your sports, <laughs> uh, where you like to travel, what kind of food you like, yeah. uh, which I never had in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, That's not the first meeting to kick off. It's more get to know afterwards once yeah. that the business is going. Yeah. I think that relates to your um, uh, emotional part, mm -hmm. uh, this click, this connection, emotional mm -hmm. connection that there need to be uh, between um, between people. Um, what do you think is driving that in Japan? What do you see as the reason for that? Because it is quite distinct. I think for me it comes back to um, somebody I mentioned, something I mentioned before, which mm -hmm. is that um, people like to put the community before the individual. Mm -hmm. And so they want to make sure if somebody intervenes in the community or, mm -hmm. or becomes as a new person part of the community, mm -hmm. that they have this emotional click, this emotional connection. Mm -hmm. And that it's not an individual that is not appreciated and that is going to break down the whole community. Mm -hmm. That's my perception. I think mm -hmm. it has to do with this community aspect. Mm -hmm. If you try to penetrate, integrate in a certain community, uh, people need to make sure that um, you're not going to be the extreme individual that is going to tear everything down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thinking about culture, you know, because you'll, you've got, as you said, a very, uh, you've got a set of principles, you've got a common tagline, uh, you've got a, a standard approach on how you remunerate and recognize people, reward people. So there's a certainly uh, an ABM Bev culture globally as an umbrella culture, but then you've got Japan, which has got its own culture, and then you've got your team, and you've got you. So what have you found works well in building a culture in Japan for your company here in Japan? Yeah, um, it's an interesting question. Um, for me, out of my experience with ABM, first of all, um, I love this company extremely very much because... It works very well for me. My personal values are very much in line with the company values. Mm -hmm. 
And in terms of two-way communication, in terms of ownership, in terms of stretching yourself, raising the bar, um, is something that I like. Mm -hmm. I, I get a great feeling of satisfaction from, from um, achieving amazing things and dreaming big for the company. Mm -hmm. um, works very well for me. When you go into a certain uh, country, um, our company culture is always the most important. Mm -hmm. We don't change our company culture. Mm -hmm. We recruit the profiles that fit in our company culture. Mm -hmm. And we are very convinced as a company that in any culture all over the world, you can find the right profiles. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to adapt your company culture to the local culture. You need to look in the local culture for the profiles that fit the company culture because mm -hmm. we want the company, company culture to be the most important one because that's how we drive success. Mm -hmm. We are, our company, ABMF, does not exist without the people. Mm -hmm. The people define the company. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have the right people that are standing for that company culture and that are mm -hmm. willing to drive success, the company will not be successful. Mm. Well, we've got, uh, if I look, I've, I've been here 37 years in Japan, right? So if I look back even, say, five years ago, if I was hiring salespeople, for example, or office manager or some position like that, the number of resumes I would get compared to today is dramatically different. And it seems that the decline in the population, decline in the youth population, uh, Japanese companies who become global, wanting to have uh, more internationalized, English-speaking you know, Japanese team members in their own teams, which they didn't compete with the uh, multinational companies or international companies like us in the past, they do now. So that sort of pool is getting smaller yep. and the competition is getting tougher. And uh, re you've got, you know, squillion recruiters out there all trying to grab people out of companies and move them around and having a lot of difficulty getting people to move. So in an ideal situation, you have got that choice of I'm going to find the right mix and match for my company's culture and I'll only employ those people. But the reality I've found is that the quality of the feed in that I'm getting to choose from has really, the pipe has really tightened, become much smaller. So how, how are you going about stocking the right type of culture in a war for talent as it is at the moment? Um, challenge of uh, every company in every country, I think. Eh? I mm -hmm. have never had uh, somebody telling me, I have a great pipeline, I have four successors lined up, and, uh, and, and it all works out very well for me. <laughs> There's always a shortage in pipeline in every company to my, uh, to my uh, experience. Um, the type of talent that we want to attract, of course, is, um, is, is kind of unique in the market, I would say, uh, 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 because it needs to fit the company culture that I, that I just explained. Um, we need to, although the pool is small, we need to find people and we want to find people that are committed to the purpose and the dream that ABMF wants to reach. The advantage that we have as a company is that we have a very big track record. We have a very big global uh, platform, global global scale. Um, we are working in a very exciting business, the beer business, right? Uh, everybody has an opinion about beer, mm -hmm. uh, if you work in the business or not. Um, and we work with the greatest brands globally. So we do have... Um, big uh, attraction factors as a company in order to also attract talent, which is less in Japan than in the other than in some of the other countries because of our position in the market, of course. That's, that's, that raises the, the certain amount of challenges, but the people that you try to attract also have a global um, mindset and a global right. way of thinking. Right. And those talented people that we, that we are looking for, they know ABMF as a mm -hmm, company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they are very attracted by the mission of ABMF in Japan as well, mm -hmm. where we want to grow and they want to be part of that dream. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's helping us to attract the right and people. And I guess, you know, one of the parts of leadership is that uh, ability to tell the narrative of the ABMF story that creates a degree of attraction and excitement and interest in someone that they think, yeah, I want to buy from this company, I want to work for this company, uh, you know, I want to support this company. So what have you found works well in telling that narrative to get people excited, be it at the customer level, be it through your marketing, or be it with individuals who are, you're trying to get to join the organization? 
Yeah. So um, that's true. I, I agree with that uh, that statement. The narrative helps helps very well. Uh, of course, the narrative needs to be translated in strategy and execution. Uh, mm-hmm. That's when it becomes very powerful. Um, a lot of the people that we attract, uh, if not all of the people, are extremely attracted by the size and the power that we have as a company globally. Mm-hmm. Um, we... Uh, our products are enjoyed by billions of consumers every day, mm-hmm. globally. Um, they also know that as a company, we have a lot of benchmarks, toolkits, best practices that we can share and implement in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, but since we are a big challenger in Japan, and Japan is a specific market between four big domestic players, um, a lot of the people are attracting in uh, translating this power of the global company into a market as, a, as Japan. Mm-hmm. So that narrative works very well. Mm-hmm. And then if you go more into the details when you're further in the hiring process or the people start to work at AB InBev and you explain more of the details of the strategy that we try to implement in Japan, you see that there's a huge amount of opportunity for us as a company. Mm-hmm. Uh, to name one thing, Greg... Uh, 95% of the beers that are consumed in Japan are lager beers, Pils mm-hmm. beers, mm-hmm. Um, led by the, the four big domestic players here. Uh, while Japan is a very mature market, very mm-hmm. developed economy, very big economy, um, average income very high, mm-hmm. typically in all the markets that we see globally, um, the beer category has evolved towards much more different tastes already mm-hmm. at this stage of mm-hmm. where the market is. Mm-hmm. Here, not yet, mm-hmm. due to many, many different reasons, also due to offer. Um, so we are bringing this offer to the market and it's a big opportunity for us because the consumer is very um, interested in that. Mm. So, you know, you, you started from Zoom meetings uh, when you weren't in Japan and then you finally get to come to Japan. Okay, you've come during COVID, so it's a bit of a, a difficult situation, you know, not a normal situation for someone coming into a new posting. But if you were going to give some advice to somebody else who, like you, has been given an opportunity to come and run the business in Japan and they don't know Japan uh, at all, they've never been here, they've never worked here, they don't have any background, what would be some advice you'd give to that new person? Um First of all, I would say congratulations, because I think Japan mm-hmm. is a great country. Yep. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity to lead an organization in Japan. Um, secondly, I would um, yeah, share some of the experience about the language barriers. Uh, I was mm-hmm. personally very surprised uh, about uh, the level of English in Japan. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I did not know um, that... Um, uh, it was more difficult to make myself understandable than I uh, than I thought uh, which initially. Is, which is better in English, France or uh, or Japan? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> You're a Belgian, so you can answer that honestly, right? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I, I I'm convinced that the level in uh, in uh, English in in France is uh, is higher. Okay. Yes, right. yes, yes, Very yes. Good. It is. It is. Yeah. So Although else? I noticed after a year that most of the Japanese people understand English. Yes. Um, yes. So that's uh, that's also something good to know because they understand. They don't speak up in mm-hmm. English, but they understand mm-hmm. and they capture what you what you say. Mm-hmm. Um, Other advice. Yeah, so, so, so the that's congratulations, sure. the language. Uh, it's, it, so you're recommending that people should study the language because you're obviously doing it, so you believe that's the right way to go? Yeah, other, yeah, yeah. Again, mm-hmm. it's a personal choice, of yep. course, how many yep. time you want, to, you want to invest in that. Um, I also take it as a personal challenge. I think mm-hmm. it's good for personal development mm-hmm. also to learn mm-hmm. uh, yeah. uh, another language, to keep challenging your own brain, right? That also mm-hmm. uh, drives us. Um, so that's, that's important. And then I would share experiences about, um, yeah, the, the driving conversation in meetings, for instance, mm-hmm. top-down communication mm-hmm. versus two-way conversation. Mm-hmm. But this also needs to be in line with the company culture. Mm-hmm. If you have a different company culture, maybe you need to you act in a, in a different way. There mm-hmm. are companies that are more top-down driven mm-hmm. uh, fully until the execution. We are, of course, top-down driven in, t- in terms of strategy, but then mm-hmm. in terms of execution, we expect a two-way conversation. Um, that's, that's what I would do. Um, 
Yeah, another advice that I could give is uh, learn golf before you come to Japan because it's okay. very. Uh, okay. So many people ask me if I play golf. Really? Uh, because okay. it's uh, it's the next level. You go to a customer, you be able to talk to the customer. Then if you go to the next level, you play uh, golf with the customer. So. Uh, and have you taken up golf? Not yet, Greg. Not yet. Uh, not yet. No, I started with the language, not with uh, not with golf. <laughs> I don't know which is harder, golf or learning <laughs> Japanese. Golf is a hell of a game. Uh, yes, I know what you mean about the golf. What other things would you suggest they do? Make sure you gain buy-in about the strategy and the execution. Mm -hmm. um, How do you do that? Uh, by, by following up if mm -hmm. the execution is done, by mm -hmm. showing the results that it drives. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a very important um, step for me. Mm -hmm. The reason why is that um, as most of the people certainly initially when I came here don't speak up. Mm -hmm. It looks like they agree with mm -hmm. what you say, mm -hmm. but as you mentioned before, sometimes they don't agree and they don't execute. Mm -hmm. So it's important to get confirmation of that buy-in, that confirmation mm -hmm. that the execution will be done, mm -hmm. implemented, mm -hmm. and to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. It's a very important step because otherwise you can think as a management committee that you're implementing the right things, but at the end it's just not being done mm -hmm. in the organization. Mm -hmm. So again, there's usually a time lag on that. So you imagine we're moving forward and then you realize, oh, we just lost a month or we've lost six weeks or whatever it might be. And then you've got to try and speed that up to catch it up. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, one other aspect that I would um, explain for somebody coming to Japan. And uh, I'm going to explain out of my experience the difference between Belgium, France. So let's say the European countries, the most, not all, but let's say Belgium, France. Um, and then coming here into, into Japan. Um, when we decide something in Belgium, mm -hmm. people start with the execution. And while running with the, the execution, they have questions about the strategy. They keep on being a debate. Is it good? Is it not good? We try to, to um, uh, adapt the direction. Uh, but people, they get basically an, a communication and they start going. In Japan... It doesn't work like that to my experience. Mm -hmm. People keep discussing, asking. They don't start to move until they fully understand, mm -hmm. until the nitty gritty detail, mm -hmm. what they need to do and when they mm -hmm. need to do it. Yep. So it means that there's a lot of conversation, mm -hmm. a lot of questioning, yep. um, which seems that you lose a lot of time, mm -hmm. depending on the type of project. It can be weeks, can be months, uh, which seems very time consuming. And it looks like, why is nobody moving in the directions that we gave? But then when everything is cleared out, everybody runs extremely fast and with an execution that is much more perfect than in probably any other part of the world. Mm -hmm. And that's very important to understand when you start here as a leader. I would have loved somebody explaining me this from the beginning mm -hmm. because it completely changes the approach that you take to things. Mm -hmm. And uh, also on that point too, uh, you're setting, you, as you said, it's a, it's a global company. It's got lots of experience. It's got lots of uh, strategies for markets. It's been in the market already for a long time. And uh, you imagine that we're going to, okay, we're going to move this strategy forward. And your headquarters also imagines, yes, uh, you know, Peter's doing a good job there in Japan. He's moving the strategy forward. Except, uh, hang on a minute. Um, nothing happening in Japan. What's Peter doing over there? You know, so you start to get that breakdown between your understanding of how decisions are reached here and then how they're executed, and headquarters, which is used to a more Belgian approach. Of we we get in the room, we make a decision, boom, we go and we 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 tweak it on the way. You know, we don't worry about getting it perfect. We'll fix it on the way. So you've got this sort of gap between the two extremes, and you're the guy in the middle. So what's been your experience for trying to bridge that problem? Yeah, I think in, 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 uh, in every different leadership position, you need to work on upwards management and downwards management, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think setting the expectations towards upper management is very important. Gaining the credibility that what you do will deliver the results. Mm -hmm. Of course, as a company, we are not patient. We need to deliver and transform, we say a lot. Uh, as a company, we need to deliver the now and transform for the future. Um, so nobody has that, that, that patience. Um, so it's not that we're getting a freeway for a couple of months or a couple of years that we don't need to deliver the results. 
Um, so you need to find the balance between making sure that you show to upper management what is happening, delivering the results, mm -hmm. while managing the team downwards, mm -hmm. um, and in order to try to accelerate things. And I think this balance, Greg, is... Upwards, you need to try to slow things down a bit yes. to gain a bit of time. Yeah. Downwards, you need to try to accelerate things <laughs> also to, to, to gain a bit of time in the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah. And if you're able to find that right balance, you come to the point you that upper, upwards management and downwards management is, uh, is matching. Yeah, I like that. Any other points uh, that advice you'd give someone coming here? Yeah, if you the, the people that would listen to this would uh, would for sure be uh, uh, people that are settling in Japan for a couple of years. Uh, as a personal advice, I would also say, make sure that the family is happy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think any good leader uh, can only perform with a strong family behind him or her. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's very important. Uh, out of my experience, again, 15 years at ABMF. Um, without a strong backup in the personal life, I could not have delivered 200% uh, passion and energy like I mm -hmm. think I've been doing for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's important. And there, uh, Japan is, is a big country uh, with a lot of um, uh, different regions, mm -hmm. uh, different uh, benefits of, of where you live, depending mm -hmm. on how old the children are, in what mm -hmm. stage of life you are, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's something to think about when mm -hmm. you settle here, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that that is uh, completely uh, clear and that you're set up for success in that way. Mm. Mm. If you uh, think we've had a, a broad discussion about many things in, in leadership so far, is there anything we should have talked about that we haven't covered so far? No, I don't think so. Okay, well, let's finish no. it off with what's your definition of leadership? Define the strategy. Mm -hmm. Engage the people mm -hmm. around that strategy. The mm -hmm. engage part is very important. Mm -hmm. Lead by example mm -hmm. to drive perfect execution. Mm. Very good. Very neat. Well, Peter, thank you. This has been a great discussion and lots of insights into coming into a new country as a new leader, uh, especially in a pandemic, and uh, finding, a, finding out how to drive things forward. So thank you. Thank you very much for your time, Craig. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. So join us again for our next episode of Japan's top business interviews.